I am here in Alabama, and uh, right behind me is Hardee's, a uh, bastion of the fast food industry. Uh, not, pick, not particularly picking on Hardee's, because uh, Hardee's isn't the only one uh, who offers starvation wages to its workers, but uh, Hardee's has been uh, one of the outlets protested here in Alabama. I'm here with Carlos uh, Chabers, and uh, you, you're an activist here. You were, uh, worked on the city council here in Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham is the largest city in Alabama. It's 74% uh, African American. And uh, recently, I believe last year, uh, you guys had passed, the city had passed uh, a minimum wage increase. So Birmingham, Alabama actually has no state minimum wage. Uh, it's one of five southern states not to actually have on the books any minimum wage. As a result, it just automatically goes to the federal minimum wage of 725. So you guys raised uh, minimum wage up to $10.10. Tell the audience what happened after that. Uh, so uh, like you said, Birmingham, a, si a city 74% black. Uh, we have a Birmingham City Council of nine members. Seven of those members are African American, other two are white. Uh, you have a black mayor. So a city that's 74% uh, black with black leadership. Uh, you know, we uh, also the largest city in the state of Alabama with 212,000 citizens. Uh, we use that. Uh, you know, when you look at the people that could benefit from a minimum wage, that's what Birmingham did. They looked at the people that work at this artist, that work at Captain D's, that work at Burger King, all these establishments that could use a minimum wage, a livable wage, especially when you look at the gentrification that's happening in Birmingham. So the city went, took a leap of faith and actually passed a resolution, an ordinance, uh, raising the minimum wage to $10.10 an hour. Uh, the state of Alabama came back and said, no, you will not do that. Uh, the first time, State Representative David Falconer, he was the one that presented an opposing bill of Birmingham's minimum wage increase. Now, David Falconer is an attorney in Alabama that makes about $314 an hour. Uh, he, want, he doesn't even live in Birmingham. He lives in the richest part of the state, which is Mount Brook, Alabama. Literally, two blocks separate the city of Birmingham and Mount Brook, and that's where David Falconer is from. So he uh, put forth a bill that would uh, strip Birmingham of raising its minimum wage. Uh, and ever since then, we've been in a battle with the state. Uh, right now, we're still in court with the state of Alabama over uh, this overreach of the authority uh, because Birmingham operate under what we call a mayor council form of government, uh, which was adapted by the state legislator. So the state legislator came up with how the city of Birmingham is actually ran. Uh, so that's why we have, you know, the state overreach, because, again, if the state was the one that created the law to say, okay, this is your form of government, then we're the ones to say, okay, this is what you can and cannot do as an actual city. And that's what happened. So the audience might be wondering why you just randomly pick in Alabama and Birmingham. There's a lot of states uh, with 725 as the minimum wage. There's a lot of states that have uh, the state government trying to stop local municipalities from creating their own minimum wage. This is all true. I'm going to get to some of those states as well. However, what's different about Alabama, obviously, if you know your history, Alabama is one of the epicenters for the history of racism, mm -hmm. uh, keeping, keeping African Americans down, whether it be lynching, whether murder, uh, all sorts of brutal stuff, um, and then obviously the economic suppression. But let me tell you the voting, what, how this uh, was voted on. So you have uh, a... Uh, on February 16, 2016, the Alabama House voted 71 to 31 for HB 174, which is the bill that would basically block Birmingham's raising to $10.10. By the way, going from $7.25 to $10.10, $10.10 is still not a livable Absolutely. wage. It's a little better, but uh, you try living off of $10.10. A lot of my, a lot of the viewers are probably living off of $10.10 or less. So, uh, in that vote. You had uh, the vote, as noted in the lawsuit, fell almost entirely along racial lines. Seventy-one members of the House, all white, uh, voted, voted against the minimum wage uh, increase, while t 27 of the 31 opponents were black. So that means there were four brave uh, white folk uh, in the legislature who voted for the minimum wage. But you have all 71, 71 members of the House, all white, voted in favor uh, of keeping the minimum wage as it is, and uh, 27 of the 31 opponents were black. There's another element here, which we were talking about. Yeah. So, you know, when you think of the South, you don't think progressive. However, there are cities that have a progressive uh, movement kind of uh, growing.
Birmingham is one of them. I'll let you tell the audience. Talk, talk about Birmingham. It's 74 percent black, but it's becoming more and more progressive. Right. So Birmingham, again, by it being the largest city in the entire state, uh, let me tell you this, $67 billion come through the city of Birmingham every single year. Uh, so there's plenty of money in the city of Birmingham. A lot of state representatives uh, down in Montgomery do a lot of business here in Birmingham. A lot of their businesses are here in Birmingham. Uh, remember when I said David Faulkner, the attorney that makes about $314 an hour. Well, his law firm is where? In the city of Birmingham. So they, the state representatives have a lot of impact as it relates to the city. So that's why when they look at a city this, this big, uh, they, you know, the largest city, Tuscaloosa, for instance, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, is uh, they're quite progressive themselves. However, Tuscaloosa is not a big city. They're pretty much a college town. They're, they're, uh, they have about 30,000 students at the University of Alabama. Outside of that, there's an additional maybe five to 6,000 people that actually live in Tuscaloosa. So Tuscaloosa is not a very large city. So if they were to implement a $10.10 minimum wage, by all means, I don't believe that the state would intervene with that. But because Birmingham is pretty much the, the, the epicenter of the, of the state of Alabama, the moneymaker of the city of Alabama, a city that has black leadership, that has, you know, that is majority black, they just don't want that to prosper. That's the bottom line to it. And I also think there's an element where you know, you joked off camera like they don't even know what a progressive is. Absolutely. But uh, if Birmingham would have passed, it was reported that Huntsville was going to try to follow suit to raise the minimum wage. Tuscaloosa was going to follow suit to raise the minimum wage. These predominantly white, mm -hmm. very, very Republican legislators, they don't want any progressive right. success in their state. And, and a part two is because now you're starting to mess with their election and their funding. If you have Huntsville and, uh, you know, uh, the second largest city uh, become uh, progressive, then you, you're talking about, okay, well, we're not progressive as, as legislators. Maybe they'll elect actual progressive into office. So that's why I think that they stay away from it. They try to keep, uh, again, like I, I told you last night in a conversation, in Birmingham we have the propensity of voting against our best interests. And that's what voters all across the state, where this state is majority white, uh, majority poor, uh, but those same individuals always vote for these rich individuals to, to lead our state, state representative, state, state uh, senator, uh, governor. Uh, so they always vote against their best interests. Uh, so which is also sounds like a common problem in the South. Anyway, yeah, absolutely. The Bible Belt, which, by the way, I'm not sure if we should say this, but Alabama watched more porn than anybody. So, you know, how contradictory. But we have more uh, people poor and uh, in the Bible Belt than, than anything. So you have a lot of mishaps going on in, in Alabama. But we do have to start. Uh, myself, we're working grassroots. I'm always in a grassroots individual. That's what we're working toward to get some things actually changed here in Alabama. Well, I think it's important also because there's two forms, well, there's many different forms of racism, but you got the type of in-your-face racism, like the President of the United States putting a white supremacist in, a, a, in his office, like Steve Bannon, or you have subtle racism where, you know, uh, let me read you some of the, some of the comments here. So you have um, se State Senator, I believe, uh, Trip Ripman. He represents uh, Mont Rose. His quote on this was, I'm not for government. Uh, really establishing the minimum wage and I do encourage people to get all their worth and if they are hired at the minimum wage that they show the people who they are working for that they are worth more than that yes mr. Uh, mr. Pittman because the people here at Hardee's the bosses here at Hardee's they, they give a damn about their employees worth they're gonna give merit raises to their employees that's not how corporate America works Absolutely. that's not how the United States of corporations work the, uh, these folks, and again, it's not just Hardee's, there's plenty of uh, fast food and minimum wage places. It is not in their interest to pay their workers. I did interviews in Oregon, at Burgerville. Uh, other independent media have done plenty on uh, minimum wage and fast food workers. They're not giving merit wages, and if you just show up on time and you work those extra hours and you're always dependable and you never call in sick and you have a smile, you're going to get raised. No, no, no. That's not how it works. Uh, we don't we don't employ on, on a merit si uh, system and people who do get plenty of raises and subsidies are corporations and oil companies okay I went on a little I went on a little rant oh, yeah, we need it. but the other the other thing is I want to get into the history here a little bit so there was a lawsuit um, filed by NAACP and others and they cited um, the equal protection uh, clause and some of the provisions in the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about that lawsuit? A judge recently, uh, unless I'm unless I am reading it wrong, uh, dismissed it. 
Yes, a, uh, a judge actually recently dismissed the uh, the lawsuit. Uh, right now, those organizations are part of uh, the appeal process to try to bring that bring that back up, uh, so that we could actually come to some resolve. Uh, you know, Alabama, unfortunately, is a pretty much a right to work state. So, so employers can fire you or hire you, and with with you know without even giving an explanation as to why. Uh, so, I think that played a huge part too in in in, in the lawsuit. Uh, as far as the actual lawsuit itself, I'm not too privy of all the details, especially as it relates to the dismissal, but because uh, I haven't sat down and actually talked very much about it, uh, but I do know people that are heavily involved with the process. And I want, I want to get into it because Alabama, uh, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, you would know uh, specifics, but they're blocking, uh, honestly, a modest increase. You're talking seven twenty-five to ten dollars and ten cents, and that's not even right away. It would systematically first it was going to go to eight dollars and fifty cents, and then ten ten. But let me tell you about Alabama. So Alabama has the fourth highest poverty rate in the United States, according to a new study by Alabama Possible. More than nine hundred thousand, or nineteen point two percent, of Alabamians live below the federal poverty line of twenty-four thousand three hundred dollars for a family of four. That's 24300 for a family of four. The data shows that 19 of the state's 67 counties have a poverty rate higher than 25%. The state's food insecurity rate is at 18.8%. So that's a whole lot of uh, very, very d despair and uh, desperate numbers. And that's not even getting into the education situation, the health care situation. Uh, to talk to me about those two. Okay, so uh, right now, one thing that the city of Birmingham literally just did last week, uh, the Birmingham City Council just pushed, uh, just passed a Birmingham food tax incentive program uh, where uh, members of the public, ma majority elderly individuals, will be able to receive rebates based upon the amount of taxes they spend on food. Uh, right now, one thing that I will say the governor has decided to do as a Republican, uh, he's looking at a committee, a task force uh, that deals with the food tax abolishment. Uh, so that's one thing. I don't know. It could be a campaign stunt, you know, because elections are coming up pretty soon. But I do believe uh, that that that's something that we have to look at. Uh, education in Birmingham right now, our, our school system, 20 years ago, we started with 60,000 students. Today, we only have 23,000. Uh, by that being a public school system, again, majority African-American, though the every student that leaves those tax dollars follow those students. With Birmingham being impoverished and, and you have so, so many deplorable communities and neighborhoods that limit the, the property taxes that we're able to use for our, our school system. Uh, so that's something that we also have to look at. That's why, again, tomorrow on Election Day, the vote that, that we're taking on tomorrow is very important so that at least some of those funds from the county will be able to go to a Birmingham school district. Uh, but uh, when you look at the city of Birmingham as it relates to food and, and food deserts, we don't have any grocery stores in some of our most blighted communities and neighborhoods. Uh, so we had the, uh, the access to food, to health care, medicine, all of those issues are happening. We're fighting a battle right now against our Birmingham Waterworks Board uh, for charging uh, Rate payers, huge, huge rates uh, through a new program where they estimate the price. We had an elderly lady usually pay 31 bucks. Uh, her bill for the past three months were $364 each month. Uh, that th she, that's a battle between her going to get her medicine, her her her, her groceries, uh, her dog food, and so much. And that that takes a toll on our individuals. That's why you know. Personally, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm running for school board locally in Birmingham because we have to change some things. Uh, and, and it just hurts me to sit back and watch to see so many of our, our kids uh, have to suffer and parents and communities suffer while the state just sit back and, and collect their hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, we have this state is so so there's so much corruption here. Every form of government is being looked at by some kind of grand jury. The governor's office, from his mistress, uh, state legislators. Yeah, tell the uh, tell the audience about that. They call him Governor Love here. Yeah, we call him uh, the Love Gov. Uh, he he has flown. He his wife. Uh, of 50 years divorced him because he had a mistress that was working in his office that he still has has denied well we have tapes of him saying things he's flown her around on state aircraft to everywhere as recently as inauguration uh, so they're utilizing state resources so he's being investigated the house speaker mike hubbard former house speaker he was just indicted and sitting in, in, in awaiting his uh, prison term uh, so you have a lot of even locally some uh, there's gr grand juries here in town right now that's looking at uh, the waterworks board and several other entities, including the mayor's office and the city council. So there is a lot of corruption. That's why we can't really be as progressive as we want because of all the corruption. And, and, and again, 
this city being 74 percent black, there's not a reason why we can't be able to utilize resources to, to, the, to the benefit of the majority of the population. And I also, I'm going to talk to some fast food workers a little later, but I also want to get down to it. So basically, whether it's Alabama, other states that do this uh, minimum wage suppression, you know, they, the fear tactics and the nonsense, oh, well, we're going to lose the job, we'll lose jobs and shut down business if we raise the minimum wage. Minimum wage has been being raised for 70-something years in America. America still stands. There is study after study showing that raising the minimum wage uh, you know, systematically does not destroy jobs. When you raise the minimum wage, wow, what a shock. You put more money into people's pockets and it puts more money into the economy, hence businesses. So yeah, you could cherry pick and there's conservative think tanks who have found uh, that minimum wage destroys businesses. But let me tell you something, McDonald's and Hardee's and these corporations, they make billions of dollars in profits. It's not that they cannot afford to pay people more, it's that they don't want to. Right. It's not about whether they can, it's about the will. But I want to read you uh, what the, the state has said um, about the lawsuit. So the lawsuit defendants led by Attorney General Luther Strange uh, lambasted claims of racial bias. Uh, racial bias as wholly implausible. Yes, so implausible in a state that lynched uh, black people and, you know, mass genocide of black people, totally implausible that race is at the bottom of this. Uh, the state's response also acknowledged that other cities were looking to follow Birmingham's lead, Huntsville and Montgomery. Uh, if Birmingham's minimum wage was raised, then they, these cities were going to try to. So that goes back to what we're saying. These are conservative, white Republican lawmakers trying to shut down progress. Mm -hmm. Well, pro the word progressive, progress. Right. So it's like they're trying to uh, kind of suppress a groundswell yeah. of workers fighting back, African Americans fighting back. Mm -hmm. There's white people. It's not just black people. There's, lo there's, there's poor white people who live here too. Uh, Alabama is predominantly white and very poor, as I read you the numbers. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, but that's what it, it, it literally takes, like, grassroots efforts to be able to change the entire dynamic. When you have the state uh, that's trying to blame race, like right now, still, we're still dealing with voting right issues here in the state. We still have a state po a prison system of majority African Americans. Uh, we have a governor who's right now uh, has a plan to build four new prisons in our state. So there's, they're not, there's no plan to invest. He's, he, the governor wants to spend $800 million to build four super prisons in our state. Uh, that's ridiculous. There's no plan to invest in education. There's no plan to raise the minimum wage. There's no plan to do anything besides, you know, create more prisons to block more people up, pretty much African Americans. Right now, Birmingham, again, there's more people that go to prison from this city than anywhere else. Without, you know, we don't even think twice. We have people that's, you know, as simple as walking down the street with a gun. That's, you know, you, you're locked up for that. We don't actually uh, give young people or anybody resources that they need to actually survive and actually, you know, to want to do better in life. We just automatically assume to lock them up. And I'll say this about the attorney general that offered that opinion. Well, he was the same guy that investigated, that was supposed to investigate the governor's office. Well, guess what? Jeff Sessions was just uh, uh, appointed as the attorney general. Someone had to fill Jeff Sessions' uh, a Senate seat. Uh, so who did they choose? Attorney General. The, the governor got to appoint someone. The governor appointed Attorney, attorney General Luther Strange, the person that's supposed to have looked into his office on the base of corruption. He has now appointed him, him on a, to, a, to a Senate seat. Uh, so now we don't know what's going to even up happening with the governor. So that's why so much corruption. That's why, again, Luther Strange's opinion does not matter. Uh, it did not matter. He, he doesn't speak for, for communities of color. He doesn't speak for the city of Birmingham. He does not work. He does not know what works best for us. So that's what, you know, for him and the governor, we just have to literally run grassroots uh, to get these individuals out of office. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do in Birmingham. And uh, last question before we take comments or questions. So bigger picture than Alabama. You know, it's this kind of like catch-22 mm -hmm. because you got these, you got these, you know, Ayn Rand-loving people like Paul Ryan, mm -hmm. the House Speaker, who says, "Oh, the takers, you know, America, it's, it's just a bunch of takers and all this nonsense." Uh, w mixed with the same Republicans and a lot of establishment Democrats, mm -hmm. oh no, we can't raise the minimum wage, this and that. Mm -hmm. So, 
we have people on food stamps who are on Medicaid, whatever, because of wages like this, yet when they need help, oh, they're the takers. So the government won't actually help the people or set up, set up opportunities for them to, to invest in them, yet when they actually need help because of these starvation wages, they're the takers and we're going to demonize them. We see it all over, conservative media. Uh, so basically, what is the playbook? How do you go forward if states like cities like Birmingham are doing the right thing, the progressive thing, but the state is squashing them? Does it need to be more nonviolent protests? Do there need to be more people like you running? Uh, what do you think needs to happen? Uh, I'm all for civil disobedience. I'm all for whatever it takes to see the best results possible. I'm all about holding our elected officials accountable, responsible, and transparent. Uh, those are the three things I'm, I'm, I'm big about. Uh, I've held protests all across this state. Uh, for everything you can think of. Matter of fact, I have a, a, a lawsuit against the current president of the United States for a protest we did down at the Boutwell, his, his campaign rally, when he came here. So I'm all about civil disobedience. We, if we need to stand in front of our elected officials' homes, I'm for that. If we need to stand in front of their office building, sit in their office building until they sit down and talk with us and hear from us, I'm for that. More importantly, again, what I'm more so for are grassroots-led effort. I'm, we're, right now, we have a plan to tackle almost every county in in this state. We're going to go around every single uh, county as we can, try to talk to as many people as we can to put more pressure on their local elected officials. We're going to use the power of social media. I held a, pre a, 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 a I single, when Trump issued his travel ban, I single-handedly uh, uh, put together a, a, a protest at the Birmingham airport, and we put, we, I brought out 2,900 people through the power of social media in less than 16 hours. So we know that we can galvanize individuals. I have, I keep, I have them text their cell phone numbers and their email addresses to my cell phone and put that into a database. We're going to run this grassroots. We have to literally go and touch as many people as we can to get the message across that we will not allow these rich individuals uh, from Trump on down. Right now, I'm probably in a battle. I'm in a battle with every branch of government from state, local to, to, to national on every issue you can think of. So there's a huge fight that we have to continue, especially as it relates to minimum wage. When you raise the minimum wage, people come out of poverty. People live better. They shop more. They spend more money. Uh, the economy does well. Uh, so we have to do those things, restore us to where we've come from. Uh, this country, make America great again. Well, make the people of America great again is how you make this country great again. Great again. And we do that by raising the minimum wage and helping to lift our most impoverished and, and, and people out of poverty and to better community. I'll vote for you. <laughs> uh, real quick, so, you know, for the trolls, for the trolls out there, because I know there's plenty of you and I, I love you dearly, you know, you get a lot of heat when you do stories like this and I come out and explicitly say this is a race thing. Well, why this is a race thing? When you have 71 lawmakers <laughs> voting to, to stop a minimum wage increase and all 71 of them are white in Alabama. Read your history. Alabama has not exactly rolled out the red carpet with flowers for black people in history. So when you have 71 lawmakers who are white voting, no, 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 we're not giving uh, a city 74% black a minimum wage increase, and uh, 27 out of 31 of the people who voted for the minimum wage increase being black, by the way, kudos to those four white lawmakers who voted with the African Americans. That is a race thing. I don't care what you say. That, that, that's numbers. So I'm not, I'm not saying all 71 of those lawmakers are consciously racist. Most racists aren't consciously racist. It's subconscious. But there's something wrong with that because those lawmakers are doing fine. They got government-issued health care. They got nice salaries. They work half the year. We know how government works. And I, I would say this about those individuals that actually voted. Uh, as you mentioned, 71 uh, of them were white, correct? Well, have, guess what? All 71 aren't de are Republicans. There are some Democrats in that mix as well that, that voted against raising the minimum wage. So when you look at what's going on in Birmingham, it's not just a Birmingham, I mean, a, a Republican or Democratic issue. This is something that, that it, it shows white supremacy at its best. When you have literally white lawmakers on both sides voting against what would benefit majority African Americans in a, in a very progressive city. So that's what you have to look at, the structure of, of, of this country. Call out white supremacy when you can. You have to. And I'm all for that. And that's exactly what I feel is going on. Even the battle of the lottery here in the state of Alabama. I went down to Montgomery a few weeks ago to fight for, to speak on behalf of the lottery at a public hearing. Uh, one of the only, there are three individuals from Birmingham that actually went down and spoke. We could see our school system benefiting from a state lottery. Lottery. However, you still have lawmakers in this state that don't want to see anything 
of of that magnitude in our state. Something that we that we could that could directly benefit millions of dollars could benefit education every single every single year. But yet our governor wants to spend eight hundred million where we don't even know where the funds are coming from to build four new prisons. Something has to give. Thanks, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, we're going to do more interviews uh, either on the Young Turks Facebook or TYT Politics Facebook. Hey, you're gonna do questions. I got one good oh, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Right. This is Tyler Pop. He says, what if it isn't about race, but they're corporate donors? You make it racist if you want to, but I think it keeps just, just as many white people uh, poor. Well, I'll let you answer, but uh, racism and uh, economics go hand in hand. So I'm sure you're right that there's a corporate aspect, but you can't erase the racial aspect either. So let's say in a state like Minnesota, which is predominantly white, that's trying to stop uh, local municipalities from raising the minimum wage. There's probably not a race issue there because there's like two, two black people in Minnesota. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. But here, I mean, the numbers are the numbers. However, corporate donors, corporate donors, I mean, economics, racism, it's like peas in a pod. So uh, I think both come to play. Yeah, absolutely. And, and economics and racism, again, go hand in hand. When you look at it, again, the power structures of Birmingham, the BBVA Compass Banks, the uh, Wells Fargo's, all these big institutions, of course, they don't want minimal wage raised because it'll, it'll, they, then they will have to raise wages for their workers. So those are the ones, again, that are funding the campaigns of these individuals. So, yes, it's an economic thing as well. However, when you look at it, it's also a race, racism plays a huge part of it as well. Why is it that the only city that's 74 percent black majority city, which, by the way, is the largest city, happens to be preyed upon as it relates to state overreach? Right. You wouldn't see this again in Tuscaloosa. They would not do that. Tuscaloosa is not majority black. Tuscaloosa is really a predominantly a small college town. So you won't see that overreach in, 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 in uh, Tuscaloosa. Right now, Tuscaloosa has open container law for the entire city. Birmingham doesn't have that, but I promise you if Birmingham was to implement something like that, the state will come in and say, no, you can't do that. So there are certain things that you see that, that it, so economics and racism definitely go hand in hand as it relates to the, the white males that are running things in Montgomery uh, from the white people that are running the the institutions that are that are paying them and uh, feeding into their their campaigns and plan for these campaigns against raising the minimum wage uh, versus the uh, city that's 74 percent black uh, because again we don't see this in any other part of Alabama where they overreach like they do in the city of Birmingham. And by the way, not to go on my soapbox, but whether you're black, white, purple, marshmallow, it doesn't matter. Why are these companies making billions of billions of dollars? You think it's the CEOs flipping the burgers? You think it's the CEOs in the drive-through machine uh, box? No. You think it's the CEOs coming in two, three hours before open, or two, three hours after close to to wipe and clean? No, hell no. If if, if workers don't show up to these places, yeah, they could get more workers, but that's how uh, McDonald's, Burger King, and by the way. Nobody at the Young Turks, uh, Carlos over here, I'm not villainizing trying to make a profit, trying to make as much money as you want. But when you do that by walking over the carcasses of your workers, that's why income inequality has exploded in this country. And to say it's not, there's not a racial element is, ha is having your head in the sand. And see, I'm, I'm not a fan of capitalism, uh, but we understand that capitalism right now rule. All we're asking right now is just allow the, the smaller people to be a part of capitalism. You know, if you if you gave, why are you making your big gift, millions of dollars as a CEO, raise the wages for your, your workers so that they can they too can enjoy the, the abilities to be able to go out and pretty much afford majority of the things that they want. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I'm, again, I'm not a fan of capitalism. I absolutely hate capitalism, but I understand. You, you mean you're a dirty socialist? Being yes. sarcastic. Yes, I am a dirty socialist. You know, CNN and them, when they say the word socialist, it's like, he's a socialist. Yeah, feel the burn, guys. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I am a socialist. Uh, I believe, you know, in uh, in uh, redistribution of wealth. Uh, we, we have to, let's speculate Wall Street. There's other ways we can approach certain things than, than uh, you know, not elect, than, than to raise funds to be able to pay for certain things instead of just not giving people what they really deserve to live. If we truly want to be America, and want to make America great again and be one of the best countries on earth, we should get pay our people higher wages. Right now, there's other countries that are doing far off better than the United States are because they pay their, their workers great great fund, great money. Uh, they, they pay for them to go to school. They do certain things like that. We don't do anything like that. Right now, our billion industry is $2 billion, uh, our college industry is $2 billion a year. That's so much we're making off the backs of young people. Uh, so we really have to change things. And I'm, I'm willing to, to I, I've given up my 
full-time job to work in our communities, uh, to work across this entire state to make sure that we, as a 23-year-old, I feel that it's my ability to, to make some, make sure that we, as a community, thrive. And that's, that's the only thing I'm out here chasing. One thing to quick clarify real quick, there's some confusion among our audience about where the population of African Americans is concentrated and how that relates to the way that the districts are apportioned for the General Assembly. So uh, right now, too, we're also, uh, so we're in what we call Central Alabama. Uh, Central Alabama is the middle part of the, of the state. Uh, so this is the, hev the, the entire county is the most heavily populated for African Americans. We have a close to, I think, a million individuals that live in the entire county of Jefferson. Uh, but we have about 700,000 that are African American, uh, which still lies in the middle of the state. Uh, which, of course, everything that comes through the state has to come through the, the state of Alabama. Right now, there's a battle. Our state representatives are having to go back and redraw lines uh, because certain laws, certain lines were drawn uh, to, to give uh, Republicans the more advantage over, uh, over districts where uh, there were majority African Americans living in those areas. So, so the gerrymandering. Gerrymandering, basically. absolutely. So that, that's something that, that is that's, we're changing right now in the, in the uh, state of Alabama. Uh, because in 12 of the 67 counties, a uh, majority of them were uh, around Jefferson County. So uh, that's something that, that they are looking at and changing in the state by law. They have to. Okay.